Hello and welcome back to the series of 100 videos for 100 cantos of Dante's Divine Comedy. Second canto of Paradiso. I don't know where we're gonna get with this video because this is a tough one, but let's try and see what comes out. It's a canto that in uh, Italian schools and general in uh, Divine Comedy anthologies is very often overlooked, just like uh, the second canto of the other two cantiques, Inferno and Purgatorio, this second canto is still part of a perennial phase of canto one and two, where Dante not only is introducing us into the, the great cantica, but he's also trying to almost summarize the entire power of the cantica in a couple of cantos, the same way that he did with Inferno and the same way uh, that he did with the Purgatorio. So here, yes, he's uh, talking about uh, astronomy under ancient and medieval terms, but in a way that uh, he is also hinting at the entire plan that he has for Paradiso. So let's try to better understand this. The second point I want to make, which is, um, I think, really crucial, is that um, relationship between the a trip that Dante, the journey that Dante is making throughout the Divine Comedy and the journey that the Dantean Ulysses made in Inferno 26. This relationship is a pillar, is really a, a very crucial stone of the entire architecture of the Divine Comedy. And uh, we will see it here again when Dante talks about sailing, uh, his own poetry as sailing, his own, his own journey as sailing, and also, very importantly, in the difference in approach and mentality and uh, state of, of his own heart between Dante the Pilgrim and Ulysses. I already described um, at a high level in my video where I was introducing Paradiso overall, this uh, topic of the Piccioletta Barca, of Dante addressing us readers and telling us um, this is uh, probably not for everyone, so you need to be prepared, you need to be in a proper ship to follow me. Overall, um, it's accepted by scholars and commentators that uh, this Pan degli Angeli that we, found, that we find at verse 11 in Canto, in Canto Second, Pan degli Angeli, is really representing theology and doctr doctrinal stu studies, philosophy, everything that from Aristotle to St. Thomas to any other Christian theology you would need to have already digested in order to properly enjoy and properly understand Paradiso. Now, I haven't read all of Aristotle, all of St. Thomas. I have a couple of books that I will try to read next year of St. Thomas himself, but uh, I sit very comfortably in my Piccioletta Barca as well, so I welcome anybody who is listening to join me in the Piccioletta Barca. I'm really not feeling like I'm in the uh, elite that Dante talks about uh, who will properly understand everything. Yes, it, it really does sound uh, snobbish, even arrogant, but uh, the, in truth, once we understand what he's doing and why he's writing this, uh, uh, I really don't think this is a matter of arrogance on Dante's part. Um, I think it's more a matter of uh, putting this uh, uh, comments in relation with uh, Ulysses, with Ulysses in Inferno 26. It's so important for Dante, the fact that uh, his alter ego, Ulysses, went down in uh, the bottom of, uh, of the sea, because not only he led his crew into an impossible journey, fully based on themselves, yo me, si me, medesimo, only myself, into and my rationality, there's nothing else. But uh, it's also the fact that uh, Ulysses made a speech to convince the crew about of following him. He wanted to convince them to follow him in this impossible journey. Over here, Dante is doing almost uh, the inverse process. He is mirroring that speech, only to the contrary, he's saying, instead of following me here, if you don't feel like you can follow me or you want to follow me, don't, and uh, go back uh, arriveder li vostri liti, to see your own uh, 
litiar, like beaches, wherever you are, safer. And if we think about uh, the narrative of the Divine Comedy, if Dante thought that he still had some baggage given by his own pride, his own arrogance, which actually was one of his sins during his own life, then he wouldn't have allowed his own character to take flight. Um, so made so light and by the purification of uh, the Garden of Eden. So we are to understand that he is not saying this with arrogance. He is uh, stating a fact here. He is actually trying to push us back and say, be careful and be very attentive. Think about what I'm going to write. This is another reason why Canto Second is still uh, a big introduction uh, made of Canto One and Two. It's only with the third canto, in every cantica, that Dante starts uh, presenting us with uh, the actual new world, with the interaction with the characters. For example, in uh, canto third of Inferno, we have the anti-Inferno, the neutrals. In uh, canto three of Purgatorio, we have King Manfred and other type of interactions. In canto three of Paradiso, he will uh, introduce us to Piccarda, a very, very crucial and important female character in Paradiso. But so far, we are still at the outskirt of Paradiso and we are still really trying to understand how to approach it with Dante's guidance. One final point before getting started with the canto itself. Um, there is a lot of uh, what we could call medieval astronomy in this canto, and so one might be tempted to smile at uh, some ideas that medieval people, but also ancient people, from St. Thomas to Ptolemy to even before Aristotle, had about uh, space and, uh, and uh, the universe. It's just, I think, every one of us is uh, tempted to do that, to feel like uh, we are the modern people, we are in 2021, we know so much about the universe and uh, astronomy, and we kind of scoff at this uh, naive little ideas that Dante had. The truth we have to remember that is the exact opposite. We have very intelligent people, smarter than most of us uh, today, I would, I would think, who put a lot of serious thought into something that they were trying to understand without even having the instruments to understand it. In particular, speaking about the moon, because this canto is all about the moon, only Galileo in 1609 was able to take this invention that was that had already been invented by uh, I believe a Danish inventor it was called the Danish uh, the Danish perspective glass Galileo studied this invention in 1609 he perfected it and uh, built the first actual telescope that's, uh, that's that's why the telescope is often accredited as a Galileo invention, but he didn't quite invent it, he perfected it from something that already existed. The genius of Galileo was that he apparently was the first one to actually turn this invention, this instrument, towards the moon. Because uh, the Danish inventor, as far as I understand, uh, did not do that. He used uh, this instrument for other purposes. Galileo turned it towards the moon, and uh, therefore he was the first one, the first human eye, to see the surface of the moon as it is, with valleys, peaks, and mountains, and corrugated as it is, was the human eye of Galileo Galilei in 1609. Before this 1609, it was impossible to understand what this uh, luminous sphere in the sky was. Um, we have to give a lot of slack to Dante and everybody who came before him for what seem what may seem to us very strange and naive ideas here on one hand um, the physics it was believed since aristotle times that the type of physics that applied on the earth do not apply did not apply away from the earth so in the universe in space it was a different set of physics altogether in fact this is reflected already in purgatory if you remember we when we read Purgatory, at a certain point, uh, all the earthly type of weather phenomenon, phenomena stop and uh, something more metaphysical and divine starts because earthly physics do not apply anymore above a certain altitude. From there on, it's completely different. There is a material that had already been uh, talked about by Aristotle and probably by somebody even before him called ether. 
A E T H E R ether. This ether was the fifth element, or this is this is where the word the, the adjective quintessential comes from, the fifth element or ether, and all the celestial bodies were made of this uh, material, of this fifth element. We on Earth we have fire, air, earth, and water, and then away from Earth, beyond Earth, we have only ether. So within the universe of Paradiso, whenever Dante is talking about uh, material, this material is in fact, uh, um, the raw material of the universe is in fact the ether. Of course there is light, and light is uh, helping ether, is using the ether to take some shapes and forms, uh, etc, etc. But we have to remember this because physics, as we think about it today, really did not exist in Dante's times. In fact, probably did not exist until Galileo and probably even until Newton. By the way, if I had to choose one song for this canto to be the soundtrack while I'm reading it, while I'm studying it, that would, without a doubt, be Fly Me to the Moon. Fly Me to the Moon that was written as, uh, in other words, as an original title, by Bart Howard in 54, and then made into the great and, and very famous song sung by Frank Sinatra later on. O voi che siete in piccioletta barca, desiderosi d'ascoltar, seguiti dietro al mio legno che cantando varca, tornate a riveder li vostri liti. Non vi mettete in pelago che forse, perdendo me, rimarreste smarriti. L'acqua che io prendo già mai non si corse. This is another crucial verb, verse. L'acqua che io prendo già mai non si corse. This water that I'm sailing the waves I take were never sailed before in Mandelbaum translation. This is the first time that Dante is telling us that uh, a poet, other poets before had actually talked about paradise. They had tried to describe heaven. Yes, it had happened before Dante, but uh, never before with the, the same level of uh, um, elaboration, the same uh, level of uh, personal investment with the, his own personal life and history, and also with the, the same type of uh, broad theological scope. Nothing as great and large and magnificent had ever been tried before by a poet, and this is what Dante is telling us. Now, to echo the grandiosity of his mission, of his plan, of his project, he is uh, using some classical references again here, Minerva Spira. Minerva was the goddess of uh, wisdom. In fact, she was the Roman goddess. In uh, ancient Greek, she was Pallas. And some translators use Pallas. In fact, I think uh, um, Anthony Esolen, as one of, of the Paradiso translators, used Pallas, the ancient uh, goddess. She is the goddess of wisdom, so that's who Dante needs. Uh, and conduce me Apollo. Apollo was called Apollo in both ancient Greece and uh, and in, in Rome, in Latin, and uh, e nove muse mi dimostran l'orse. The technical translation of this verse is and nine, uh, and the nine muses show me the bears. The bears are the two constellations, the Orsa Minor and Orsa Major that were used for navigation, they still are, and, uh, and so they are the, the two bears. Some say that uh, this nove could be the number nine, which is nove in Italian, but also nove uh, in Italian means also new. And therefore Dante might play with the double significance of the new muses. He is now singing of the Christian God. Therefore, he wants to detach a little from the pagan divinities. And therefore he, ta he talks about new muses, new goddesses. This is possible, though, it might be a stretch because Dante, like many medieval uh, thinkers, was also always about uh, this integration. And now we get to the Pandeliangeli, the Bird of Angels. Voi altri pochi che dezzaste il collo per tempo al Pandeliangeli, del quale vive si qui, ma non sen vien satollo. The expression Bread of Angels, in fact, is a biblical expression, comes from Psalm 77. Men ate the bread, of, the bread of angels, and Dante talks about the bread of angels in his Convivio. So we know that really fundamentally he's now referring to the 
understanding or comprehension of philosophy and theology and Christian doctrine, and the having digested all that together with having your own faith and experience of God. There is never a satisfaction of our hunger for anybody who eats this bread of angel, angels. So, which provides man here with life, gives us life. Uh, in fact, uh, it's an, if we want, it's an echo of uh, our Lord's Prayer as well. Give us our daily bread. But hungering for more. So, here, here in our life, in our mortal life, only revealed knowledge can uh, give us that nurturing that we need for the desire that we constantly have to understand reality, to gain a perfect uh, understanding of reality and totality. We can never reach it. Uh, only in the afterlife uh, we have the ability, the possibility to reach that type of omnicomprehensive knowledge. And that's why the bread of angels, even if we eat it, even if, we, if it nurtures us, it never really satisfies our hunger. A very quick note on language here. Dante is using a lot of um, metonymies in this canto. For example, legno, which means wood, to call a boat, a ship. And uh, di different translators either follow literally Dante or do something else. Another metonymy is found uh, here where uh, on verse uh, 13 Dante says metter potete ben per l'alto sale sale in Italian means salt so Mandelbaum says you may indeed commit your vessel to the deep salt sea salt sea because Dante is using with a metonymy an attribute of the sea salt to say the entire sea and so to, to translate it as sea would be good, would be okay, but it would uh, bypass the, the linguistic operation that Dante is doing here. Vostro navigio, servando mio solco dinanzi all'acqua che ritorna e quale. It's almost uh, a little intimidating the way we are led to look at the water behind the beautiful boat on which Dante is sailing. The water closes behind him and returns perfectly peaceful. We can see it as a movie, this Dante in front in the silence who's sailing, who's sailing forward. Now, quei gloriosi, or those men of glory, are the Argonauts, the myth of Jason and the Argonauts. We know that uh, in Metamorphosis, uh, book seven, always going back to Ovid, always, 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 the king of Colchis had promised uh, the famous golden fleece to Jason on condition that he would uh, execute almost impossible deeds, including to plow a field using the horns of two oxen that were turned upside down. And they also had, they were breathing fire, they were fire-breathing oxen. So it was a near impossible task, but he was helped by Medea in the myth. And uh, that's how he could make it, because she prepared a concoction for him to resist the fire of the oxen. It's incredible the fact that Dante is comparing himself to Jason in this per in this tercet because he's um, in the, just three lines saying a couple of things. The first thing he's saying is uh, highlighting the uniqueness of uh, his enterprise, his adventure and uh, glorious mission of writing Paradiso. Number one, something that's never tried before, just like the Argonauts sailing to Colchid, which had never been tried before. Number two, he is also talking about the admiration for somebody who achieved something, but not by himself. He achieved something that was being helped by a woman. And this is also a, a very good connection between uh, Jason and Dante. Dante Beatrice, Jason and Medea. That's what Dante is implying here as well. And finally, in a sense, Dante is uh, comparing the Golden Fleece to what he is really, really after in Paradiso, and he's been after for the entire Divine Comedy, which is the love, the move, the stars, the sun and the other stars. He is after a transcendental experience and to see a glimpse of God, of the Divine, going towards God, the desire for the Divine that is innate. It's been concreata, meaning created together with, created together our, with our soul, so the thirst, and everlasting uh, for the godly realm, 
bore us away as swiftly as the heavens that you see. Faster than light. That's how fast Dante and Beatrice are flying up in the sky. Beatrice gazed upward, Beatrice in suso, e io in lei guardava. Dante is looking in her eyes while she is looking upward. Now, Dante still doesn't really know that he has arrived um, to the sphere of the moon, the circle of the moon, but he realizes that he is, there's something wonderful that catches his eye. So while Dante is distracted by all these wonderful things that he's seeing, Beatrice, si lieta come bella. I love this. So joyful and uh, beautiful. So joyful and beautiful. Uh, because as, as we go through Paradiso, we always need to remember that there is a constant sense of joy that should carry us in uh, reading this poem. And Dante helps us, of course. Mandelbaum says um, her gladness matched her loveliness. So glad and lovely are the adjectives that Mandelbaum chooses. So with this uh, joy, she tells him, Drizza la mente in Dio grata. Be thankful to God. The first uh, emotion that should burst from you, Dante, is a sense of gratefulness, of thankfulness for God to having allowed you to be here in this uh, circle of the moon. Dante will be thankful and uh, will express his genuine gratitude to God for being there in a few tercets. But the first thing he does, and I love it, is uh, he gives us, the readers, his immediate impressions of what he's seeing. And this that follow could be considered the most beautiful tercets in this second canto of Paradiso because visually at least they are absolutely gorgeous. Um, let's read them in Italian quickly. Pareva me che nube ne coprisse, lucida, spessa, solida e pulita, quasi adamante che lo sol ferisse. Per entro se l'eterna margarita ne ricevette come acqua recepe raggio di luce permanendo unita and uh, Mandelbaum says it seemed to me that we were covered by a brilliant solid dense and stainless cloud much like a diamond that the sun has struck into itself the everlasting pearl received us just as water will accept a ray of light and yet remain intact Purely from an aesthetic point of view, purely from the image standpoint, um, we are here almost at the peak of visual beauty. And to think that this is the same poem where uh, back, in, back in Malevolge, for example, Dante was describing feces on people's heads, the tone has definitely, definitely changed. It's also very interesting that, that now with this tercets, Dante is already introducing the very thorny, very deep and profound and difficult theological topic and argument that he will then, through Beatrice, develop in the rest of the canto. He introduces the concept of a body being compenetrated by another solid body and yet not being separated. A solid body like a, like a knife can enter a body like a human flesh Yes, it can, but the, the, the flesh gets cut, get, gets open, separated. In this case, it stays intact and united, no difference, even if another body enters it at the same time. And it's Dante's way to not only introduce the topic that, we'll, that he will talk about in the rest of the canto, but also to introduce uh, one of probably the two main Christian mysteries that he's exploring with his Paradiso. One is the Trinity, and the other one is this one, which is the Incarnation. This is why on verse 40, Dante is in fact saying, our longing should, should be even more inflamed to see that essence. That we should have even more desire to understand, if we think about this, more desire to understand that essence, the Christ essence, uh, divine and human at the same time in which we discern how God and human nature were made one. Dante is also very quickly and almost casually dropping a philosophical nuclear bomb here at uh, verse uh, 44 and 45, where he says, uh, uh, not demonstrated but directly known, even as the first truth that man believes. This is a way for Dante to say that the, the man, even if he's not uh, 
culturally conditioned by religion, beliefs, or even by the revealed knowledge, man as a human being uh, already believes some truths that are primal, that are first truths. And one of these is uh, the nature that is divine and human of Jesus Christ. In other words, he's telling us not believing in the divine is a cultural construct. Believing in God and in what this uh, consists of and in what this means is the natural state of the human being. Now the second part of this uh, second canto starts exactly at verse 40, 49. Dante seems to, all of a sudden, he seems to go off a tangent and he asks about the lunar spots, the moon spots. Uh, the first time I read it, I, I swear, I really did not understand why he was asking about them. It seemed such a random question. To, among all the questions that he could ask, Beatrice, who knows everything about uh, space and universe, why are you asking about the lunar spots? That's such a specific technical question to ask. Um, but then I gradually understood that uh, he is asking a question that has uh, consequences that are valid and important for the entire structure of Paradiso and for the entire Cantica. So let's see exactly why. In reality, this question had always been very troubling for uh, ancient philosophers, for theologians uh, and for later scientists like Galileo himself. He started one of his uh, most important essays speaking about uh, the, the lunar spots. Why do we see from here those dark shades on the, on the moon? What are they about? We have no idea. Once again, only Galileo with his telescope could for the first time uh, understand or start to understand what they are. The problem was that uh, was actually very deep because uh, it came from the philosophical question how can we have so much difference in uh, a space that is filled with ether, this material that is uh, the fifth element, the quintessential element, and yet so diversified when we know that the divine is one, is the unity. And so how can all this difference come from unity and why? There were two solutions, two answers to this main question, and these two answers uh, in, involved two very different uh, conceptions of the world and two very different worldviews. The first one was coming from Aristotle, and he, Aristotle, had proposed a difference, a differentiation that had a quantitative nature. In other words, uh, more or less of uh, some material was causing the, all the differences in the universe. And this, in fact, is what Dante is proposing to Beatrice in the Canto as uh, the quantitative, let's say, the solution of the natural philosopher. It's about uh, rarefied areas versus more dense areas in the moon. This solution was actually taken up by Averroe and uh, the Muslim philosopher. And Dante, for a while, had actually um, bought into it, he actually had believed that solution for himself. Later on, it's a revision of his own belief that takes him to a more metaphysical and theological solution, which is the second answer. And the second answer was proposed initially by Neoplatonics and Christian theologians, and then by St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, personally, I believe that Dante perfected his own thinking after he properly read St. Thomas. And uh, this solution is that these differences that we can see in the universe are not due to material principles or anything that has to do with uh, the raw material of the universe, the ether or the quantity, but they are due to uh, qualitative differences. In other words, to formal principles. In fact, uh, ancient philosophy Already, distinct, already in Aristotle distinguished between formal principles and material principles. Formal principles were ideas and uh, principles that gave shape to things, while uh, material principles were, for example, the ether, the material of the universe. Now, let's go back to verse 49, where the second part of the canto starts from. From here, what uh, Dante does in a very simple way, he basically offers uh, three 
options, three explanations of the, the lunar spots. Um, one is the most uh, superstitious one, let's say the one of a sorcerer. The second one is the explanation of the natural philosopher. And the third one is the explanation of the theologian. And uh, through Beatrice's monologue, he uh, quickly destroys the first one. And then he gradually destroys the second one as well to finally get to the real one, the true one for Dante, which is the theological reason. And once again, the process that takes uh, Beatrice and Dante through all the different steps to understand why the natural philosopher opinion or, or option does not work is uh, one of the most fascinating examples of uh, medieval science. Most of all, it reminds me how whenever we hear about the scientific method having been invented by Galileo or for the first time applied by Galileo in the 17th century, really that's very simplistic because uh, the method that Dante and Beatrice follow here is nothing else than the scientific method. So let's take the legend, the sorcerer option, and uh, put it on the side because even Dante thought it was silly. It was, there was a legend according to which uh, Cain, from Abel and Cain, because of his uh, murder of Abel, had been exiled on the moon and uh, he was uh, punished with all these uh, thorns and uh, these thorns um, were what caused the darkness on the moon. Dante already brushes it aside in the first tercet. Then uh, Beatrice, when she hears Dante's question, she smiles and uh, she introduces a method of, uh, a dialogic method, let's say a method of inquiry, that was uh, very structured and very common in the scholastic uh, schools and universities in Dante's times. It was called the Questio, the Questio model. First of all, the student himself or herself would put forward the first hypothesis. Then there would be the confutatio or uh, a second step where the professor or the student or anybody else would try to destroy the hypothesis in, in some way. And then a third step where they would finally present and expose the correct idea uh, based on the confutation of the first hypothesis. But tell me what you think of it yourself. So just like in the scholastic method, Beatrice is asking Dante to say his own opinion. And his own opinion is repeating what Dante used to think, which is what Averroe had elaborated from Aristotle. What seems to us diverse up here is caused, I think, by matter dense and rare very telegraphic. I think the what he, what he means is I think the lunar spots are caused by the fact that some areas of the moon, which let's remember because Dante didn't know anything about the surface of the moon, so they would imagine it as a perfect sphere, are caused by some areas that are more rarefied versus other areas that are more dense. That's what, so basically a different quantity, a quantitative difference in the material of the moon. And here Beatrice replies, you certainly will see that your belief is deeply sunk in error. If you listen carefully, as I rebut it, the eighth sphere, which is the sphere of the fixed stars, offers many lights to you, the many stars. And you can tell that they, in quality and size, if rarity and density alone caused this, this meaning this difference, then all the stars would, shed, would share one power distributed in lesser, greater, or in equal force. But different powers must be fruit of different formal principles. Were you correct, one only would be left and the rest destroyed. In other words, she is echoing St. Thomas Aquinas here in uh, confirming the fact that uh, the nature of difference comes from uh, um, formal principles and not from material principles. They are different divine ideas. And now she moves on to confute the Averroian theory. And more, where rarity the cause of the dim spots you question, then there would be two options. In part, this planet would lack matter through and through, or else, as in a body, lean and fat can alternate so would this planet alternate the pages, the pages in its volume? Just fantastic to read this. 
One option is that the spherical moon would have just empty spaces, holes through it. Only this option is not going to work out because in the example of an eclipsis, when we see an eclipsis, a solar eclipsis, we don't see the, the moon being like an emmental cheese. We don't see holes throughout, throughout the moon. Therefore, that option doesn't stand. So the second option must be either true or, Beatrice says, if it's not true, then you are wrong and there is another explanation. This experiment that uh, Beatrice describes, it's uh, visually stunning. It's uh, actually not too difficult to understand. She says, uh, yes, even if the light of this candle that we see in the third mirror, which is the farthest one out of the three mirrors, is more distant, it is smaller because it's more distant, but the brightness of the light is the same. So we have a, almost a physical demonstration through this kind of experiment that the brightness would be the same if the light was to bounce off the moon um, both on more dense and less dense areas. Verse 106. Now, just as the submatter of the snow, it's a little, uh, it sounds, it sounds almost uh, too technical, this verb, this uh, word that Mandelbaum chooses here, sub-matter. Um, Dante uses uh, soggetto, the subject of the snow, almost as if he was saying the raw material of the snow. Really, he's referring to water. So, what Beatrice is saying here, just as the sub-matter of the snow, water, beneath the blows of the warm rays of the sun, is stripped of both its former color and its cold, so your mind left bare of error. So is your mind left bare of error. I am now disclosing to you the truth. I have explained to you why what you thought was wrong. So she explains to Dante the entire composition of the universe, and this is why I'm saying Canto 2, the second canto, is giving us something that is much broader than simply the question that Dante asked, something that really describes the entire universe. On 124, it's probably the most important part of what uh, Beatrice is telling Dante. She is saying, now do attend to how I pass by way of reason the truth you want. It is the, the summary, the, the core of her disquisition. The force and motion of the holy spheres must be inspired by the blessed movers. These blessed movers are the angelic intelligences, the angels that God has predisposed to manage each sphere. So the blessed movers, just as the smith imparts the hammer's art. And so from the deep mind, the deep mind once again is the divine intelligence expressed in these angels that makes it will the sphere that many lights adorn, again the sphere of the fixed stars or the eighth sphere, receives that stamp of which it then becomes the seal, receives the idea of the various differences of creation. That's how the fixed stars are the first sphere, counting down from Imperium, that receives this idea of differences, all the different ideas. And as the souls within your dust is shared, our dust is our bodies. We are dust and we will go back to dust by different organs. So just like uh, our different organs of our body have different potentiality, so does that mind, this intelligence, angelic intelligence, unfold and multiply its bounty through the varied heavens. So to make things uh, as clear as possible, we have these uh, spheres that move in the, sp in the universe, but they don't move by themselves. They are actually, this movement is given by these uh, blessed motors or angels that are guided by, by God. And this is the crux of the, of, of the matter. The sensible world is moved and is governed and, and is managed by a reality that is intelligible, although immaterial. St. Thomas took this concept of the intelligences, the blessed motors of the space coming from Aristotle and integrated it into a biblical narrative and called them angels. This is what St. Thomas did and this is what Dante is repeating in, in the second canto. Therefore, the 
darker areas of the moon that we can see from our naked eye are due to a substantial difference, a qualitative difference, uh, which is funded in the ideas themselves, the different ideas that are imparted by this angelic intelligence. And uh, the parts of lesser worth are shining less brightly than the parts of more worth. In this way, St. Thomas had reconduced every type of difference in the universe to formal principles. Verse 139, with the dear body that it quickens and with which as life in you it too is bound, this dear body of Bandelbaum translation is in fact the prezioso corpo of Dante. And prezioso corpo is really this ether that I was talking about before, this uh, material that all the universe beyond Earth is made of. Because of the glad nature of its source, because everything in the world and universe is good, it's only a matter of uh, more or less good. So the qualitative difference under the divine light doesn't mean that something is bad and something is good. It means that everything is good, but something is a bit more good than, than the rest. The power mingled with a sphere shines forth as gladness through the living pupil shines. Very, very beautiful simile here. From this, and not from the matter rare or dense, derive the differences from light to light. This is the forming principle. At this point, you can probably understand why many Italian books are not including this canto in their anthologies for students. Yes, it's complicated, but it's also very, very important, as you can probably gather from this uh, brief explanation that I try to, to do. Very important because it brings everything together in such an all-encompassing way the view of the universe um, according to St. Thomas, and therefore according to Dante, his own evolution in his thinking, and uh, I just find it fascinating. It doesn't mean that I completely understand the entire canto, I'm probably still far from it, but uh, I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to hearing from you guys, if you, how difficult you found it, uh, if you found some of, the, of my explanations not too clear, please do ask me and uh, I'll try to clarify any points. Thank you very, very much for watching this uh, other video and we'll move on to Canto 3 in the next one.